Today's reading is going to come out of Matthew 8. Matthew 8, uh, Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship or the cost of following him in Matthew 8, verse 18. It says, and onward, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. There's a couple little nuggets in there that I would like to uh, pull out. And the first would be that when Jesus is talking about the cost of following him, a scribe comes to him. And a scribe would have been somebody who was more familiar with the Pharisees and the Sadducees than with Jesus. So he's risking quite a bit to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus' response to him is, you haven't considered the cost of following me. Then you have another man. So in other words, there is an inherent cost to following Christ. There's another man who comes up to him and says, Jesus, let me first go and bury my father, then I'll follow you. Jesus, I'll go wherever you want, but first let me go and bury my father. This is not talking about the man's father literally had just passed away and he needs to go care for this dead body and get everything settled at the crematorium. No, none of that was going on. This wasn't him going to the funeral home or anything. No, this, this was an expression of the day. The expression of the day, let me go first and bury my father, means wait until I get my inheritance, then I'll follow you. You see, he wasn't saying, oh, my father just died, let me go and bury him and then I'll come and follow you. No, what he was saying was a, a colloquialism of the day. Look, my, wait till I get my inheritance. Once my dad passes away, I'll have my inheritance and then I'll come follow you. And Jesus says, don't bother. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the people who are dead spiritually be concerned about such things such as inheritances of money. Jesus had something greater in mind in service to him. There's also one last nugget that is actually something that you'll find useful in other parts of Scripture. Jesus calls himself here the Son of Man. He says, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And when we think of the term Son of Man, most people's gut reaction or first thought is that Jesus is referring to himself, Son of Man, as his man side. He's perfectly God. He's perfectly man. So when he refers to himself as the son of man, he's referring to himself as his human side, right? But that, and that's true. He is referring to himself in that sense. But let me give you something to add to that. That is not the most important part of why he calls himself the son of man. Every single time that Jesus calls himself the son of man, he is actually pointing back to Scripture in the Old Testament. He's pointing back to Daniel 7. He's pointing back to Daniel 7. Let me just read this to you. I saw in the night visions. This is Daniel speaking. And behold, when the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And listen to this Son of Man. He comes to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. And to him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Every time that Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man, he's not just saying that he's perfectly God and perfectly man. He's not just talking about the incarnation. He's talking about this prophecy in Daniel 7. So when he says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he's saying that the Son of Man is the one that was referenced in Daniel 7 who is to be given all glory and honor and dominion and all people shall serve him. He's really highlighting and glorifying himself and glorifying the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the riches of your word, your holy scripture, which is perfectly able and all-sufficient to be able to equip us to do the good work that you have purposed for us. 
Everything within your word is what we need and everything that we need in order to live a life pleasing to you. We ask that you would help us live lives that are pleasing to you, that you would lead us in righteousness and that you would lead us away from temptation and sinfulness. That, Lord, that you would, in our lives and in the lives of those that you put around us to share your gospel, that you would bring the fruitfulness of salvation to bear. You'd give us courage to share the gospel more boldly and that, Lord, you would lead us in your way everlasting. We thank you that we can gather here in your name to worship you and to fellowship with one another, encouraging one another with your scripture and to good works. We thank you for all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.